Got you. Father God, we just come boldly at your feet, Lord, laying down everything and anything that's not of you, Father God. I just praise you and thank you for this ministry, Father God. Thank you for this word that you put on Brother George's heart tonight, Father God. Anoint his lips, Father God. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. We can't copy it. We can't mimic it, Father God. It's only the authority that you give us to be able to walk out in uh, spirit and truth, Father God. Let us worship in that tonight, Father God. Let us come boldly at your feet, Father God. We just come boldly, leaving our burdens, our cares, our anxieties, fears, everything and anything that's not of you, Father God. We leave it at your feet. We sit next to you, Father God, in the throne room and in in, in, in just pray your grace come upon us, Father God, and your mercy is new every day, Father God. Weeping may endure the night, but joy, joy comes in the morning, Lord. Let us trust in you, Father God, and lean not on our own understanding, Father God. Acknowledge you in everything that we do so that you can continue to guide our steps in this ministry, continue to uh, guide our path in this ministry, Father God. I thank you for the mighty men of God that you have on here, Father God. I thank you for everything that you're doing in their lives, Lord. Continue to reveal yourself to them so that they can be pour into others, Father God. That's what it's all about is making disciples, Father God. And pouring into others, edifying them, building them up, encouraging them, oh Lord. We just draw our strength from you, nothing else, Father God. We no longer live in this body. It's only the power that comes from you. The only way that you work is in us and through us. It's nothing that we can do. Father God, I just lift up this ministry, Lord. I just plead the blood of Jesus over this ministry. I plead the blood of Jesus over Brother George, Father God. Oh, I just uh, uh, pray for a holy barrier over this uh, uh, ministry that you entrusted us with, Father God. I praise you and thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord. Continue that work, Father God, through the Holy Spirit. I just praise you, Lord. Thank you for everybody that's on here tonight, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Continue, Father God. That word is continued. This this year is a year of double portion, Father God. We speak it into existence right now over this ministry, Father God. We proclaim it and decree it in the name of Jesus. Have your way tonight. Open our, our, our hearts, our eyes and ears, Father God. Our spiritual ears, our spiritual eyes, Father God. Open our hearts, Father God. It's only through our, the renewing of our mind and our hearts daily that we can come and learn. Let us learn tonight. Let us ask questions, Father God. And I praise you and thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank, thank you, God. Lord Jesus. Thank you, Brother Wes. Thank you, thank Brother Wes. Thank you. All right, guys. Man, God bless you guys in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, man. Shout out to each and every one of you guys, man, that has took the time um, to jump on our Monday night. We were built for this building sessions. Uh, shout out to Houston, Texas. Shout out to Michigan. Shout out to Cali, Colorado, man, Fort Worth, Texas. Shout out to everybody that's part of this ministry. And also Amen. shout out to our community. Amen. Today we begin uh, a series, guys. It's 2020. Um, like Brother Wes uh, uh, was mentioning in his prayer, man, this year is the year of double portion. This year is the year of vision, man. Though we may have glasses, though we may be blind from one eye, um, God has promised to give us his 2020 vision this year. Um, yes, he's Lord. showing us and equipping us. I believe that God has put um, a burden on the hearts of men, on the hearts of leaders to disciple more, to lead more, um, to guide each other more, to hold each other accountable more. You know what I mean? Mm. So this year, God's just thankful um, I give God all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise for what he's doing in my life and also what he's doing through this ministry. And I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for being here today. Um, today we start a three-part series, okay? So this is part one of a three-part series of a topic that the Lord has placed on my heart, and that is a right to live. A right to live. Who here knows that God gave us the right to live, right? Amen. God has given us the right to live, my brothers. Since the day that he created human beings, since the day that he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave us a right to live, right? But as years have gone by, as centuries have gone by, 
the world has corrupted our way of thinking and viewing that right that God has given us to live, mm. right? Millions and millions of people in the world that don't live but simply survive. They're surviving, waiting on the next uh, a glass of water, waiting on the next meal, uh, waiting on that next uh, a sunrise so they can feel warmth upon their skin because the cold, the night was too cold. Or, or waiting mm. for that cold breeze in, in, at midnight because the sun has been exhausted. Like the, the day has been exhausted. It's been hot. They haven't had no shelter. They've been thirsty. Um, so many different people um, have a different view of what living is, right? Mm. And I know for a long time, me, myself, I, I simply survived, guys. Simply survived from one fix to the next fix. From one Straight lick up. to the next lick. From one high to the next high. But I believe that God has brought forth a generation, men like me, men like you guys, like Big D was saying, this generation right here has been chosen to pour into the remnant, to pour into the next generation. We have been chosen to proclaim the full counsel of God, right? And then the we were built for this ministry that's exactly the goal that God has placed on our hearts as we enter into 2020. Mm. Our job here today as leaders, as teachers, as ministers, as brothers, as accountability partners, is to be able to dissect this word and find every answer to life within it, right? But in order to do so, in order to be able to move in that direction, we have to be able to understand beginning, to the end, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we might get a little confused as we enter into certain areas of the Bible and certain scriptures of the Bible, um, certain books of the Bible. Um, you have the Old Testament, which is uh, 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 history, law, prophets. Um, then you got the New Testament, which is the four gospels, which is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then you have the uh, epistles. You got the pastoral letters. Um, that were written by Paul, Peter, Jude. Then you have the book of Revelations that is mainly symbolic. But what I'm trying to say is that everything that you need pertaining to life is in here. You don't have to read it in chronological order. You don't have to read it from beginning to end. But you do have to be able to understand what you're reading. And that, my brother, is possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want everybody here to know that the author, the author of the written word, lives inside of you. The author of the written That's word right. lives inside of you. If you're ever having a hard time reading your Bible, ask the author of the word which is inside you to give you a jump start, to give you a push. Ask him to help you. Give, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what his word is saying because he's already inside of you. I promise you this, my brother, you have more of this word inside of you than you think you do. <laughs> I promise you, because the Holy Spirit, the author, Jesus Christ himself has chosen to reside in you as his holy temple. Amen? So with that being said, Amen. Being said um, we're going to take a road trip, guys. We're going to take a road trip. Over the next three um, teachings, we're going to take a road trip um, in the Bible, right? And we're going to dig deep, and we're going to read scriptures, and we're going to ask questions. And we're going to ask God to reveal to us exactly what it is that he wants us to know in this season. And I believe that in this season, mm. God wants to know that he has always, always given us the right to live. My brothers, the world, if you ask the world, if you ask an, an atheist, if you ask a somebody that doesn't believe the same thing we believe, if they if you ask them about the Bible and you ask them about the Old Testament, you know what they say? They say that the God of the Old Testament, that there's no way that the God of the Old Testament can possibly be the God of the New Testament, right? That's one of the things that you hear a lot. Then they'll say, well, if God was so good, then why did he murder all those people in the Old Testament, right? Those are the type of things that are thrown at you when you ask questions or when, when people come and they ask you, um, um, things about the Bible, things about the Old Testament. Oh, well, God must be bipolar. He must be looking down 
on the world, picking and choosing who he can save. No, 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 no. God has given us a right to live since the book of Genesis. He's made it clear. The Amen. Bible says that God is the same today. He was the same yesterday. And he is the same forevermore. He is the beginning and he is the end. The only thing is that people have got a view of the Bible that is incorrect. So because of that, we're going to dive deep, my brothers. <clears throat> I'm going to start this by reading you a small portion or a small paragraph of the book that I was reading that, was reading that was called The Holiness of God. Okay, so I don't want to take any credit for this portion of it because I got this from a book. Okay, so if you want to write The Holiness of God, I'm going to read something to you. Right. <laughs> if you need to stop me, please do. Okay, so there was this Roman Catholic theologian. And yes, I said Catholic. Okay. <laughs> there was a Roman Catholic <laughs> theologian, and his name was Hans Kung. And he was writing a book about the view of the God of the Old Testament. And this is what he said A Roman Catholic theologian writing about God's harsh judgment in the Old Testament says that the most mysterious aspect of the mystery of sin is not that the sinner deserves to die, but rather that the sinner in the average situation continues to exist. So what this theologian was saying, that it's not crazy that a sinner deserves to die. That's not the crazy part. The crazy part about the Bible in the Old Testament, it's not that the sinner deserved to die, but that on most occasions, the sinner continued to live, right? The key to this observation is that he speaks of sinners continuing to live in the average situation that is customary or usual for God to be forbearing. But God is indeed long-suffering, patient, slow to anger, and in fact, he is so slow to anger that when his anger does erupt, we are shocked and offended by it. And we forget rather quickly that God's patience is designed to lead us to repentance, to give us the time to be redeemed. Instead of taking advantage of his patience, we should be coming humbly to him for forgiveness. And we use this grace as an opportunity to be more bold in our sin. We delude ourselves into thinking that either God doesn't care about it or he is powerless to punish us. So what is this guy saying? This guy saying that in the Old Testament, when sinners continuously disobeyed time and time and time and time again, the crazy part about it wasn't that they continued to live. I mean, that they, that they deserve to die, but that they continue to sin, Right. And in the Old Testament, God constantly showed his love, his mercy, his grace, and continued to give humanity an opportunity over and over again, right? But a lot of times we, we, we read scriptures like my brother Rogelio was telling me he was reading about when David went to the Philistine camp to bring the Ark of the Covenant back and the ox slipped and the Ark of the Covenant happened to tilt and Uzziah tried to reach for it. And when he touched it, he died, right? Because part of the commandments was, was that he wasn't allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant un unless he was a Levitical priest. We read stories like that and we're like, really, God? Really? You're going you're gonna to kill him just because he touched the Ark of the Covenant? Or we read stories like the, um, in the book of Acts when um, <clears throat> uh, somebody can help me. The husband and the wife that sold the property. Anybody know their names? Yeah, they, they lied. They had lied about the money. They had lied about the money. I can't remember their names. Amen, amen. So they sold the property, and they were supposed to bring um, the offerings to 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 the congregation. But they lied about the money, right? And what happened? The Holy Spirit struck them dead. Peter told them, "You didn't lie to us. You lied to the Holy Spirit, right?" Mm. Meaning you lied. To him. And he struck them dead. And we hear stories like that, and we're like, "Man, God, don't you think that's a little bit too much?" But my question to you is it is this is it is it too much is it too much that God continuously gives us the right to live continuously gives us his mercy and grace over and over again that when he finally decides to judge or when he finally decides to act 
based off of his character, which is hating sin, that he acts, that we find it surprising, that we think like, oh man, what's going on, really? Like we act like God isn't holy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like we act, we act like God doesn't hate sin, right? Now again, the reason I'm starting here is because I want to give you guys an understanding of the character of God towards sin. And again, mm. like I said, we're, we're going to take a road trip. We're going to start at the beginning and go at the end. So yes, Jesus Christ is coming. Yes, the Holy Spirit is coming. We're going to touch on all these notes. But we're going to start with God's sovereign grace to a rebellious people from the jump. From Come the on. beginning. From the beginning. The story of the Old Testament is not a story of a harsh God. If this is the Ananias and, 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 Ananias and Sapphira, that's the names, guys. You all want yep. to write that down. Thank you. Um, so the story of the Old Testament is not a story of a harsh God. It's not. But it's a story of a loving, merciful God on a stiff-necked people that time after time, they rebelled against a holy God. That's the story of That's the reality, my brothers. That time and time again, God continued to show his love. God continued to show his mercy. And God continued to show his grace on people mm. that continued to rebel against what he had said. Now, we're, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to the beginning. So if everybody got their Bibles, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 and 17. And if Amen. you get there first, read that. And let us know what version you're reading out of. And read verse 15 through 17. Anybody? The word of the Lord reads, I got a new King James version. The word of the Lord reads, and I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to hey, Adam, he said, yes, sir. Are you reading the right one? It's Genesis chapter two, verse 15 and 17, bro. My bad. I was on three. <laughs> Uh, Genesis 2. Got it, right? Verse 15, yep. 17. All right. The word of the Lord reads, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Wes. So this right here, I, I want you guys to picture this, right? And if you can, close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes. <clears throat> and I want you to imagine. Take a breath and imagine a fresh breath of air coming into your nostrils the minute you wake up. The first breath that you take. You Ooh. wake up. Imagine yourself being in the shoes of Adam, waking up almost like you had just fallen asleep and, and God breathed his Holy Spirit inside of Adam and he wakes up, right? You open your eyes and you look around and everything's perfect. Everything's there for you. Your house, light. You know that there's food in the fridge because you went and bought some groceries, but in God's scenario, God had provided everything for Adam. You look around, you see water, you see animals, you feel the breeze on your skin as you start to kind of walk around in this body that almost feels like you've been in it before, but really it's your first breath, so you don't really know, but all you know that it feels right, right? Mm. Imagine Adam waking up that day when God breathed his breath of life inside of him, and wakes up to paradise. That's what Adam woke up to. He woke up to paradise. Everything was at his feet. Everything was at his hand. And God gave him dominion, gave him power and authority 
over everything. That's right. But he gave one commandment. One commandment. Now, I was going to ask this question before, but I wanted to give you that scenario. But what was the first commandment ever given? Most people, you ask them, and they're going to tell you the first commandment in the, ten, in the Ten Commandments, right? But the first commandment was actually given in the Garden of Eden. Guys. The first commandment ever given was given in the Garden of Eden. And that commandment was, off of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. That was the command. Well, Always know that God doesn't give a commandment without giving you a consequence. He doesn't well, tell you what you should do without letting you know what could happen if you do do it. Yeah, you man. understand that? God That's is right. not a God of disorder. He's not a God of confusion. He tells you, if you're obedient to me, you'll be blessed. But he also tells you that if you don't disobey me, there's going to be consequences. You reap what you sow, right? A lot of people that's in the powerful, world, bro. they call it karma. Man, bro, that's, they just stole that from us. They stole that from you reap what you sow. That's what the Bible says. You that's know what right. I'm saying? What goes around comes around. Yeah, that's true. You know why? Because the Bible says that, right? So God made it clear. Don't eat off this tree because the day that you do, you shall surely die. Now, mm -hmm. I want to give you guys an understanding. This was the first commandment that was ever given to humanity. First commandment that was ever given to humanity. This was the day that God gave humanity an opportunity to choose love over fear. Let me repeat that. Amen. When God gave them that commandment, he said, look, I'm giving you a choice. That's what he said. Now, again, this can go up for a theological debate on a, so many different levels. But God gave them a choice. He said, you see that tree right there? Don't eat it. Because <laughs> if you do, you're going to die. Right? Die. Yeah. He gave them the opportunity to choose love over fear. Why love? Because if they love God, if they love everything that he had done, they would choose to obey. Right? But most of the time, out of fear, most of the time, us in our fear, us, us in, 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 at a quick response, we, we'll do what we were told not to do, right? Our flesh kind of gets, oh, man, like, I just want to do it. I just, just want, I just want to touch it, right? And it's truly out of fear why we disobey, right? Mm. Come on. It's truly out of fear, right? Come on. Because we're so scared to be honest and to say that we truly want something that instead we go behind the back and we do it because we're so scared to be honest. We're so scared to be honest. Right? But he gave him the opportunity to choose love over fear. Right? A lot of people say, no, well, God gave the law and, and you had to fall. No, 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 no. He gave you a choice. Come on. He gave you a choice. He didn't force you to keep nothing. He gave you a choice. And this is this is how. This is what I feel like, like Adam or, or like the angels, two angels in heaven were conversating. Like, really? He just did that? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he had the choice. He didn't have to do it. Look at every other tree. Look at every other animal. Like, he could have ate whatever he wanted, but really he had to go and do that. So Adam had everything given to him, life. Everything he needed was has, at, at his disposal. But this Man. was the day that humanity shows that their will was better than God's will. This was the day that humanity chose that their will was better than God's will. Now, we all know there was a culprit there, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that, that Satan, the, the, the slithering serpent was there talking into their ear. But who here has heard this? It wasn't an issue that Satan was talking to Eve. The issue was that she started conversating with Right. How many times do we find ourselves conversating with sin? How many times do we find ourselves conversating with the devil when we know that we shouldn't? Right? Come on, say that How again. Many, you know what I mean? How many times do we find ourselves conversating with the devil when we know that we shouldn't? You know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. So, Brother the George. issue was, yes, sir. 
what was it? The, uh, it said this was the day humanity chose their will was greater than God's will. Was better. Than God's was will. better. And again, this this was a choice, right? This was the day <clears throat> that humanity declared war. War. Right. They declared war on the precepts and statutes of a holy and righteous God. Mm. On this day, treason was committed against the creator, the architect of all things, the God of the universe, and all his majesty. See, when God gave Adam and Eve a commandment, my brothers, he gave them a choice. That's right. But he didn't just... He didn't, he didn't leave them starving in a garden with nothing and then put this real nice tree in the middle and say, don't eat from that. No, 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 no. First, he provided everything. He offered them everything. He gave them everything. Then he gave them a choice. Who all here knows that when a blessing comes, most of the time it comes with rest responsibility. Right? Amen. Straight up. Straight up. There you go, biggest man. blessings come with the biggest responsibilities. Yeah. <laughs> so check this out. Do you hear that, Travis? So, <clears throat> What's that? The big I heard, I heard responsibilities. I'm sorry. I missed that the last part of that. Your biggest blessings come with the biggest responsibility. Amen. That's the truth. <laughs> and so again, let I want to go I want to go back real quick because I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of this. So the Lord told Adam. Off of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But off mm. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you do, you shall surely die. So we know God wasn't joking. We know God wasn't playing. We know God was being serious. He told him, if you disobey me, you're going to die. Right? That's pretty much what he told him. So we know, based off the word, based off of what the Holy Spirit has, has written in his word, we know <clears throat> that the punishment for that disobedience was death. That's, that's what the word says. So you see, the punishment for sin was death. Okay? Mm -hmm. Was death. And until this day, my brothers, as we speak right now, me and you still suffer the consequences of the punishment of that sin. And that is a natural death. Right? Right? Because God wanted us to be immortal. God wanted us to live forever. But when he realized that we had, well, not when he realized, let me, let, me, let me step back from that. But when God seen that we were sinful and that we would continue to choose sin over him, he took those years from us. Come on. He took those years from us. If you look in the book of, of Genesis and the story of Noah, he said, my spirit will not live with them forever. After this, their years won't go past 120. Because they were living till they were 900, uh, right. 1,053 years old. You know what I'm saying? But this day, uh, up until right now, we suffer the consequences of that sin. And that's a natural death, right? I don't know you're if born. you guys knew that. It's called the Adam Principle. Well, the Adam Principle is the sin in which we live in. The cause of it, the, the, the repercussion of it is that we die. We right, die. right die of old age you know what i'm saying so check Amen. this out i have a quote here that i want to share with you guys this was a quote from albert einstein okay and and just so y'all know he was a jew <laughs> 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 i told that to my brother <laughs> no, but what i'm saying is look, look, look at his understanding this dude, dude was a physicist he was a scientist uh, albert einstein helped design uh the atom bomb Right, that blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nagasaki. Hey, he was a he was a genius. Yeah, he was. He was a genius. Right up. And you know, and you know, you know, Albert Einstein was a genius when it came to math. When it came to math, but you know that he could barely read. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He was a genius in his area. Right, he was a genius in his lane. He was nothing like the rough genius. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, but check this out. This is a quote from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said this, it is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man. Mm. 
it is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man. <laughs> the, day, the day that humanity rebelled against God, we became as far away as we could possibly be from the presence of God, as deep in sin as we could ever imagine, right? Hitler ain't got nothing on Adam. You know what I'm saying? Napoleon ain't got nothing on Adam. You know what I'm saying? His error, his mistake, his sin corrupted our nature to the fullest. I mean, bad. If you ever wondered why you were so bad in your sin, it's because when, when, right, so we, let me, let me rephrase. When we, we spoke about where sin came from, right? In, in another lesson, we talked about how sin started in the heart of Lucifer in, in heaven and then mm. snuck its way into earth, right? In the garden. And then we inherited that from Adam, right? So when Lucifer finally convinced Adam and Eve to sin, right? Just like he convinced the, the, the third of the angels to rebel. Once Adam sinned, it became part of us. Sin became part of our nature. It became part of who we were. But thank God for Jesus Christ, right? Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, man. Um, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. But at that point in time, our very nature was corrupted, guys. And mm. my goal in this lesson is to teach you and show you how corrupt we actually were before Christ. Because in order for you to able, able, ever be able to minister and deliver and, 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 and preach the word effectively and show somebody who is down and out how bad they are, it's to first know how bad you were. Right? Come on. One thing that I always learn from Big D is this. Big D always starts off his testimony by reminding people how bad he was. Letting people know that without him, he ain't nothing. That without Jesus Christ, he ain't nothing, right? At, at our church, right? Every time we start our testimony, we say, to begin with, we'd like to give all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for... Oh, man. Cat got my tongue. Oh, hello. Salvation of my soul and the forgiveness of my sins. For the salvation of my soul and the forgiveness of my many, 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 many sins. Right? So we start off by, by showing it and, 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 help, and letting people know, man, I can relate to you. I've been there. I was with you in my sin. Completely lost. Broken, busted, and disgusted. Right? I so like Albert Einstein knew. He knew that that it's it's easier to denature something as 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 um it was easier to denature something as as how do I put it as unstable as plutonium than to denature the human spirit, right? So the Old Testament, my brothers, is not simply a story of the law and prophets and history and war, but it's the evidence. All right, check this out. If you want to write this down, the Old Testament is evidence of God's sovereignty, mercy, grace, power, and love that came to climax on that Friday morning on Golgotha Hill as our Savior hung on the cross as atonement for our sins. Mm. So everything that the Old Testament was building up to Every commandment, every word from Adam and Eve to Noah to, to Samson to David, Solomon, uh, uh, Elijah, uh, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, all that came to climax on Golgotha Hill when our Lord and Savior was bleeding for our sins. So let me repeat that. The Old Testament, the Bible, is evidence of God's sovereignty, mercy, grace, power, and love that came to climax on that Friday morning on Golgotha Hill as our Savior hung on the cross as atonement for our sins. Now, what is climax? Climax is when it finally, boom, right? So the evidence is there. And the Old Testament is there constantly over and 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 over again. And all of that, for one day, when Jesus hung on the cross for our sins, 
the proof that this is real is that it was here in the Old Testament is the fact that God made himself known to all generations and all people. The fact that Jesus Christ hung on the cross and died and was buried and resurrected on the third day and ascended into heaven. The fact that we know and believe that that was real is because God has made it known from the get-go. He has always given us a right to live. Always. Right? But let me not get ahead of myself, right? Because we're going to end there. We're going to climax in this teaching with our Lord and Savior. We're going to end in the New Testament, right? So I don't want to get too far into it. But what do we know? We know that when God gave a commandment, the punishment was death. We know that. And we know that that death wasn't only naturally, but ultimately complete separation from God, right? So I was being lost in hell, right? So we know that. So let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to try to finish this in the next 10 minutes, guys. So you just bear with me and then we can answer whatever questions, anything that you guys may have. Uh, Big D, <laughs> if you got your Bible, bro, if you can read uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And if you could do it out of the NLT, that would be great. Y'all yeah, got it right here. Okay. 5, verse 12 says... Uh, <clears throat> Y'all got to deal with my voice right now, man. I've been trying to get my voice back. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 it says, uh, Adam and Christ contrasted. When Adam sinned, sin entered in the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Mm. That's the New Testament, guys. Thank you, Big D. You're welcome. That's the New Testament speaking about the sin that Adam first let in, right? And it says that sin entered the world through Adam. So we know that sin entered the world or sin entered the garden through the door of pride, right, in Satan's heart. But what was the door, right? What was the door in which sin entered this world into our life? Adam, right? Adam was the door that was used for sin to enter. Now, again, and I want to touch base on this really quick. A lot of us blame Eve, right? Well, it was Eve that did it. It was Eve that did it. Well, the Bible says that when she took a, a bite of the apple, then she gave to her husband who was with her. That's what the Bible says. That means that Adam was sitting there watching his girl have a conversation with the enemy. Adam was sitting there, and instead of holding her accountable, he just sat there and let her conversate. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Who did Adam give the commandment? Who did God give the commandment to? To Adam. God didn't give the commandment to Eve. He gave the commandment to Adam. And then Adam related the commandment to his wife. So when the enemy killed and stripped the wife, Adam was right there watching the whole time. So when you get to heaven, my brother, and you die, you're going to have to get in line. Because when I see Adam, I'm going to punch him in his grill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Knock the horn off that boy's head. Right. Why'd you do it, bro? Why'd you do it? <laughs> um, so we know that Adam's sin brought death. And death spread, death spread to everyone because everyone sinned. So we all have fallen short of God's glory That's because right. of that. All of us, my brothers. Check out this other quote that I have right here. And if you want to write it down, um, you can. Charles Spurgeon, great theologian, <clears throat> he said this. He said, as salt flavors every drop in the Atlantic. As mm. salt flavors every drop of the Atlantic. So does sin affect every atom of our nature. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there. That if you cannot detect it, you are deceived. Come on, bro. Jim was saying, look, bro, you telling me that you don't sin is like you telling me there isn't salt in the ocean. <laughs> right. I mean, that, that's pretty much what he's saying, straight up. You know what I mean? I know I was that person for a long time, bro. 
I was that holy roller, Bible thumper. You know what I'm saying? Nobody could tell me nothing, bro, until God showed me how wicked I was without his son, Jesus. You know what Amen. I'm saying? Until God showed me, bro, how, how wicked I still am. Because sometimes I don't, right. I don't, I don't want to read, bro. Sometimes I don't want, like, sometimes I don't want to get up and, and worship. Sometimes my flesh convinces me that, that other things are important, bro. And I got to fight for my time with the Lord. I got to fight for my time with Jesus, bro. I got to fight with my time to pray and get on my knees, bro. And, and tell, this, tell this flesh that he's a punk and that, that the Holy Spirit in me is the champion and Lord overall. You know what I'm saying? I have to tell myself this. What's up, Alan? Hey guys, well I'm at a, I'm at church right now. We're about to start our meeting. I was just letting you all know that I'm about to get off. I love y'all. Love you, Alan. God bless you, mighty man of God. Amen. God bless all y'all. Love y'all, brothers. Amen. So check it out. So we're not sinners because we sin. That's not what makes us a sinner. But on the other hand, we sin because we are sinners. Amen. Right? Hey, brother George. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to go over uh, Romans five twelve real quick. There's three different points. Um, is a physical death, a spiritual death, and an eternal death. Hey, Amen. Hey, can we let me let me finish this and hold on to that thought, bro? And we'll do yeah. that in the in the building section. Give me a few more minutes. I'm almost done. Is that okay? Hey, Amen. Okay. So we are not sinners. Hold on to that. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. We are not sinners right. because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. So check this out. Adam's decision to disobey God laid, led to the storing up of the biggest inheritance that the world would ever see before Jesus Christ. Mm. Adam's decision to disobey God led to the storing up of the biggest inheritance that the world would ever see before Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ has a bigger inheritance. There's greater riches waiting. But before Jesus Christ, before you accepted Jesus Christ, Adam had stored up the biggest inheritance, bro, that anyone could ever, ever see came from Adam. Every generation would be directly connected to this inheritance, and everyone would reap the consequences of the inheritance. I'm going to tell you right now, Jay-Z, Donald Trump, and every other billionaire that you can imagine, bro, has nothing on the inheritance that Adam stored up just for you on the day that he sinned. <laughs> mm. Think about El Chapo, bro. Talk, talk, think about the person with the biggest money or the most money in the world. Imagine the money that they leave for the, their family. That ain't nothing on the inheritance that Adam had stored up for every generation, bro, when he sinned. Now, why is that? Why is that, right? Here's the deal. All you have to do is be born, and you become an heir to the promise. David said, I was born and conceived in sin. Let me tell you something, my brother, and let, let me get this through your head. There ain't nothing that you can do to earn hell. Nothing, bro. Because you're born to pray. You're right. born to, into practice. You're born in sin. And there is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. Both of right them, up. there is nothing you can do. You are born in sin because in Adam, and you get to go to heaven because of Jesus Christ. It ain't nothing that you've done. It's what Christ has done. All right? The Bible makes it clear that there's good people in hell, bro, right now burning because they rejected the gospel. Mm. Like, oh, wow, I was good. I, 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 you know, I gave to the homeless, and, 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 and I never killed nobody, and, and I didn't lie, but that Jesus stuff, that ain't for me. I'm not a drug addict. What you mean? Only drug addicts need Jesus. I'm not a gang member. What you mean? I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not struggling with my sexuality. Why would I need Jesus? Right? This is what good, or what the world calls good, people say. Mm. They don't need our savior. They don't need us. Right? But check this out. Genesis chapter three, verse seventeen and nineteen, and I'm gonna read this. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19 says, Then Adam, then to Adam he said, This is God speaking to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Mm. In the Taken for you are dust, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. So God told Adam, Hey, you messed up. You messed up, right? This was God making it clear that his commandment and his word was going to stand. What he told God, what he told Adam that he would do, he was going to keep it, right? So there was something that we did. Hey, Wes, hit your mute button, bro. There was nothing that we did to be born to inherit this creature. Nothing. It's, it's, it's part of our being. Hey, Daniel, Daniel, don't hit your new button, bro. And we're almost done, guys. So there was nothing that we did apart from being born to inherit the nature of sin. It is now part of our very nature, down to the last molecule. Now, this is where we transition. You might be wondering, okay, Brother George, so you've made it clear. God gave a commandment. Adam messed that up. The punishment was death. What, what does this pertain to life? How does this pertain to mercy? How does this pertain to grace? If all you've explained is the wrath, punishment, and the consequence of our sin. Well, it was at this point and at this time that God gave us the right to live. Everybody turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And Rogelio, if you can read that, please. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And the Lord, the, uh, what did the Lord read? And the Lord God Go made ahead, clothing Lord. from animal skin for Adam and his wife. So it was the moment that Adam and Eve sinned. That moment, even though God had made it clear that the commandment was that they should eat and that if they did, they would die, God made it clear that the punishment was death. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. This was the first sacrifice that earth ever seen. And the sacrifice came from the Lord. First one, guys. Have you ever heard that the best moment to repent of your sin is the minute you do it? <laughs> right after you do it, bro. Call somebody. Get on your knees, bro. Ask for forgiveness. Because I promise you, the Lord is not sitting there waiting with a sledgehammer, waiting to just paw drive you the minute you mess up. That's not God's nature, bro. It's not. It's in God's nature. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner, bro. He loves the sinner. He loves his people, bro. He loves them. And even after he had told him that the punishment was death, he offered a sacrifice, my brothers, and covered them. through. And check this out. And I'm going to read this myself. And y'all can write this down. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. 3.22 and 23, Lamentations. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Mm. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. I'm going to say that three times. Through the Lord's Maybe. mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are you. Every morning, great is your faithfulness. Praise God. That's God's character, bro. Proverbs 16.6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Bro, this is Old Testament, bro. <laughs> this is Old Testament. People always want to talk about how the Old Testament is nothing but wrath and punishment. No, 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 no. It's mercy and grace. Bro, grace and mercy, it's a doctrine, bro. It's a flow of scripture that started in Genesis and ends in Revelation with our Lord and Savior coming back on the cloud with the voice of an archangel screaming, bro, 
screaming for his people to meet him up in the sky. Again, Proverbs 16, verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. So it is through mercy, my brothers, and truth that atonement is provided for sin. So what is the truth? The truth is that we sinned. We failed. We neglected the dominion over a perfect world for a simple pleasure that only lasted a moment and affected eternity, bro. That's the truth. But what is mercy? Mercy is that when we deserved wrath, punishment, death, God showed us his grace. Right? Because it says that by mercy and truth, atonement is, is provided for iniquity. Right? There has to be truth. And there has to be mercy. But by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Right? So how did, how did God show us his grace? That was by the atonement of a lamb, skin to cover our shame. The opportunity to live once again, even though he had said that if we disobeyed, we would die. And it is through that grace that the fear of the Lord should come upon us. Respect. Reverence for God should always lead us away from evil. Always. It should. We don't always take it that way. But it should, my brothers. Because Proverbs 16, 6. Again, I'm closing with this scripture. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Now, as we close out this part, right, I think the Lord has made it clear that even though he said that he would punish your sin, he provided a sacrifice for your sin. That even though Adam allowed sin to enter into every generation that came forth, God has also made it clear that he's giving you grace, mercy. He has given you the right to live again, even though the sins that we commit lead us to life. Right? If you're in a season in your life right now that it's hard to depart from evil, that it's hard to depart from sin, porn, cigarettes, alcohol, drinking, fornication, whatever it may be, and I said alcohol and drinking, not that those are necessarily sins, but hey, if it's murder, co um, uh, uh, coveting, idolatry, whatever it may be, if you're in a season right now where sin Hold you captive. My brother, I want you to know that God is giving you the right to live again. And you can see it anywhere in this Bible. Anywhere. Bro, you can go to the Old Testament and find his mercy. You can go to the book of Psalms and find his grace. You can go to the book of, of Isaiah and find our Lord and Savior 700 years before he ever even walked on this earth. We have no excuse. It is there. And how? How? Psalms 119, 116 says, Uphold me according to your word that I may live. And do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me according to your word that I may live. And do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just come before you right now in the name of Jesus, God. Father God, I know that each and every one of us stand here today wondering how we could make it to the next day. So many of us come from a defeated life. So many of us come from a background, Father God, where we chose to disobey constantly over and over and over again. And stayed stuck in that because we didn't know that you gave us the right to live. That in the midst of our sin, you covered our sin. That in the depths yes, of our depravity, you reached down, Father God, and became a human and was tempted like us, hungered like us, thirst like yes, us, Lord. Father God, walked, slept, breathed like us, Father God, that we may know that you gave us the right to live again. 
Father God, I pray that if we're still stuck in certain seasons of our life, Father God, mm. that keep us in bondage, that keep us in chains, let us know, Father God, that you gave us the right to live again. Your son, yeah, Jesus, Lord. came down Lord. as a human being, Father God, and Lord, lived. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. He hung on our cross, Father God, after being beat, bruised, battered, his beard torn out, his head uh, swollen from poisonous thorns, Father God, that covered his skull, Father God, pierced, Father God, in the ribs, Father God, and killed at the cross for forgiveness of our sins, Father God. He was buried for three days and rose a victorious, victorious, conquering day that Sunday morning, Father God, when death was defeated, sin was defeated because he wanted us to live again. The gospel has been made known to us, Father God. If we need to accept you again, let us accept you again. There should be no shame in our hope, like Psalms 119 says. I, I need you, Jesus. I need you to cover my sin. I need you to forgive me for what I did before I got on this call. I need you to forgive me for what I'm going to do when I get off this call. I need you, Father God, to come into my life, help me die to self on a day-to-day -day basis, and help me live for you the way you die for me. We honor you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.